Hi everybody and welcome to another Facebook and YouTube Live with me, Tisa Blackburn, the Acrylic Diva. Today we are going to continue our discussion about composition and the topic today under the headline composition is intention and how what we put down on the canvas can create the intention that we're after and how important things like color, shape, and line are to the type of intention we're trying to create. So I'm going to just check real quick and see how everybody's doing. If we have any questions, I will let you know that I'm broadcasting both into Facebook and YouTube Live today. So if you have questions, just hang out in the chat box and I'll get over there as quick as I can, okay? All right, coming up, I'm going to talk to you about some very important artists and what they were trying to do and how they created these works. And what do I mean when I say intention? Well, when we create a work of art, we are communicating with the viewer. Whether you like it or not, that's what you're doing. So, you should have control over what kind of intention you're putting out and hopefully the kind of reaction that you're getting from the viewer. So, first things first, let's look at a very, I want to say, confrontational image that definitely has a particular intention in mind. First up, we're going to look at Edvard Munch, The Scream. Now, this is a hugely, hugely popular piece. It is widely known in modern art circles, and you're going to see a very specific intention with this painting. So, um, Munch, of course, was in the German Expressionist sort of mode of, of uh, thought there. And the, uh, about, I'm going to say this, about 1890s, um, uh, he did the sort of, it started the series of paintings. One of them started with a painting called Sick Mood at Sunset, Despair, and that was a precursor to the scream. And then he records in his diary uh, in January of 1892, he recorded the inspiration for the scream, and he says, I quote, I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun went down. I felt a gust of melancholy. Suddenly the sky turned bloody red. I stopped, leaned against the railing, tired to death as the flaming skies hung like blood and sword over the blue-black fjord and the city, my friends went on. I stood there trembling with anxiety, and I felt a vast, infinite scream through nature." Now, it's clearly obvious here that Munk is trying to impart a particular type of um, mood to us. I mean, it's it's pretty obvious. And he does so with particular colors and lines and things like that. Um, the, the interesting part of this is that he's doing this with some very simple elements. He's not doing anything too fancy. So what he's primarily using here to convey this intention of despair and melancholy is the idea first of this very deep perspective. The figure in the foreground, uh, in the middle foreground, has this leading line, which we talked about last week, the leading line behind him going off into the distance, into this sort of empty distance, and there's some smaller figures in the background. And then you've got this bloody orange sky and the complementary color of blue. And then if you look at the figure, the face, and all the other lighter areas of the painting, they're gray. There is no pure white in this painting. They're gray. So there's this very moody kind of somber feeling. And the shapes of the water are not pleasing. They're sort of aggressive and the leading lines that point us back into the distance feel like we're going into this kind of endless vast landscape 
of no return. So he really does get that sense of melancholy and despair and aloneness. He really puts it forward with not only the figure's face, which has a sort of horrific um, expression on it, but also the colors, the somberness of these grays, the way that he's using those leading lines, all really helps to create this sense. Now, let me just, before I go on, I just want to make sure uh, that we're doing okay over here in the chat room. I want to say hello so you know where the chat room is. Hello, here's the chat room. Okay. And if you have any questions, just let me know. I will pop in and out of the chat room every few minutes. Okay, so now we've looked at Edvard Munch. And by the way, there is an amazing exhibition of his work here in San Francisco. If you get a chance and you're in the Bay Area, pop over and check it out. Um, let's go to someone who was kind of a contemporary and is at the other end of the spectrum. This is Mary Cassatt, and she was an expatriate living in, in France. She spent a lot of time with Edgar Degas and worked a lot in pastel and in oil, both painting in pastel and, and oil. Um, so now we're looking at what I would consider the other end of the spectrum with intention when it comes to expressing a feeling and, and creating an elicit, eliciting a response from the viewer. So we've got Mary Cassatt, and this is mother and child uh, from about, I've lost the, hold on a second, let me get you the correct, um, I want to say that's about 1860 maybe, something like that. Don't quote me on that, but, but close. Um, so what's the difference between the uh, Cassatt piece here and the Edvard Munch piece that we just looked at? Some big differences. Now, they're using similar color schemes, believe it or not. They're both using orange and blue, the complementary color schemes, to create the mood. But Cassatt's piece is creating this very pleasant maternal piece that's soothing and has a bit of romance to it. Um, I'm going to put Edvard Munk back up for a second just so you can contrast. Okay, there's Edvard Munk, blue and uh, orange, but radically different the way he's treating the colors and the shapes. And of course, Cassatt. Her pieces are much more real. Her, her images, the image is a realism, sort of impressionist realism, and the soft shapes of the, uh, sh of the faces, and then also the soft colors. So I want you to pay close attention to the difference between Edvard Munch's color and Mary Cassatt's color. Her colors have a lot of white in them. They're pastel, they're soft. The only really dark colors that you have here are in the hair of the woman and the child. And so you've, you're really setting up this very soft kind of feeling and eliciting a much softer response from the viewer um, with these types of soft colors. So keep that in mind when you're working and you're looking at you know, how you're going to create a particular type of response from the viewer. It's going to hang on a lot of things, but one of the big things is color. So the difference between Munch and Cassatt here with color. Now, let's move on to the issue of um, shape. So last week, we looked at one of my favorite painters, Stuart Davis. And uh, this is one of his pieces. I'm going to say it's from the, you know, it's from the 1930s, maybe about 1939, something like that. Um, and once again, if you weren't with me last week, Stuart Davis was a contemporary of um, William de Kooning and some of the other abstract expressionists. He lived in New York City on 8th Avenue, or had his studio on 8th Avenue for many, many years. And he was a jazz aficionado. So if you look at this piece, 
here you have these bold colors and these whimsical shapes um, and the color especially the color and the shape are really creating this kind of cacophony of sound that really kind of sounds like New York City and New York you know and jazz clubs and things like that so he's setting that up that's his intention that's the response he's looking for from the viewer and he's doing that with shape and color and some other things too but primarily shape and color okay now let's jump over to someone else I truly love and that is Kandinsky Vasily Kandinsky this is a piece of his um, hmm, I'm gonna say from the 19 teens I don't know the exact date on it but Kandinsky was from the Russian uh, kind of constructivist movement and had a big impact on uh, modern art in terms of sort of the theories of modern art so one of his really famous books called Concerning the Spiritual in Art I'm gonna put it here in the chat box Concerning the Spiritual in Art uh, by Kandinsky I think I also posted it last week um, We'll it, it will talk a lot about shape and line and color and the differences between them and what you can do with them and so on. But what I really wanted to concentrate on with this piece was to compare this to Stuart Davis and the difference between the types of, if you will, the types of sound that you could hear sort of by creating the shape and the color and in some respects the line in this one especially the difference between these types of sounds or these types of space that are set up and the intention so in this one with Kandinsky we've got this sort of open airy space and if I were listening to this if this were a piece of music it might be lyrical or classical um, and it would have a lot of lighter weight types of music. On the other hand, if you look at Stuart Davis, this compressed space, these big chunky shapes, and this bold color, this is going to be more like rock and roll, okay? So do you see the difference between the two? Rock and roll or jazz, and then maybe, you know, classical, Vivaldi, okay? I just want to kind of give you the feel about how you're in complete control of the intention that you create when you start working with things like shape and line and color on canvas. So pretty powerful stuff. Let me check the chat box. Anybody over here okay? We're doing fine over there. I'm gonna look at the chat box over here and see if we got anybody. Okay, looks good. Okay, moving on. Um, I want to bring up two people um, and talk a little bit about shape and, and color with these two people as well. The first one I'm going to show you is Elizabeth Murray and she uh, was around the time of um, well she just died in 2008 I think from lung cancer. It hasn't been that long. She was working in the you know late 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s uh, that type of thing and you know you can see some very strong uh, comparisons here to things like pop art um, you know Roy Lichtenstein and Frank Stella and people like that but look at the this sort of again kind of whimsical um, shapes that she's using these bold bright colors and the intention here, of course, is, is joyful. I'm, the, the whole idea behind these pieces is to create a sense of joy and fun. So she was a, an amazing painter, and a lot of these pieces, too, are on three-dimensional canvases. So when you see those shaped pieces like the yellow blobby shape there, that might be the big blobby shape in the upper, sort of upper rightish side. That might that we, that is probably on a canvas that is shaped like that. They're very complex, so um, complicated, uh, whimsical, colorful, bold. All of these 
types of descriptive words that can go into describing some of Elizabeth Murray's pieces. And we can use those same words when we talk about Stuart Davis. But you can't use words when you're talking about Elizabeth Murray. You wouldn't describe her work as somber or moody or mysterious. So you see what I'm getting at when I'm talking about shape and color and line and how powerful these images, I mean these elements are when you're working. There are going to be certain things that you're going to want to do when you are trying to create a particular type of intention. So it always comes back to that that crazy word intention. What do you want to do? And if you know what you're trying to create, then you can use the tools of line, color, shape, texture, all those other tools. You can use those to get where you're trying to go. Okay? So now let's look at someone who is challenging. Uh, he is going to push buttons the minute he comes on the screen. This is Philip Guston, and this is one of his Klansman pieces. Um, he was, in my humble opinion, an amazing painter. Uh, a lot of people don't like him because he's, he's very challenging, pushes buttons all over the place. But here we have these shapes, line, color. They kind of seem a little whimsical, don't they, at first? It's this cartoon image. And then you realize that it's a hooded figure that there's something about that hooded figure that is not frivolous, not whimsical. There's something going on there. And I was raised in the Deep South, so I have, I bring a lot of my own baggage to pieces like this. When someone depicts someone wearing a white sheet like this, I have a lot of baggage around that. So um, even though Philip Guston is using these kind of comic book clunky types of shapes. He's got a very serious content and a very strong intention going on here. So do you always have to use dark colors, uh, grayed out colors or um, that type of thing to create a kind of a somber mood? Not necessarily. You can paint in red and bright green and all of that kind of stuff and still have this intense serious content. So that's one of the things that in my opinion makes Philip Guston such a great painter. He, he was an amazing painter. And I'll put these um, artist names in the show notes so that you'll be able to look them up at your leisure and, and take a good long look at their bio. Um, his biography especially is is really uh, interesting. And I just want to read you a tiny little piece of something about Philip Guston that um, was written in The Guardian. Um, it's, it's about a, a, a show that was um, up in 2015. Now he died in, I think he died in the 80s. Um, so and he, they immigrated from Russia, his family immigrated from Russia, but he grew up in Los Angeles. And so he, he did a lot of paintings based on the Klansmen, and there's some very interesting biography about him. But one of the, the things that this particular art critic said about this particular show of, of Philip Guston's in 2015 was, I just want to read you the last... Um, the last paragraph. It says that Guston was a painter of brute matter and even more squalid inclinations. He is a great corrective to so much fancy and flimsy tinkering in contemporary painting. He makes an artist like Anselm Kiefer look effete and mannered. And so that's some pretty powerful verbiage to lay down there, but um, I'll put Anselm Kiefer in the show notes as well so you can compare them and see for yourself if, in fact, this reviewer was on the money. I think he was. Um, I think it was a pretty spot-on review of some of Gaston's work. And again, it's very challenging. It's not 
it's not to everyone's taste but he really makes you think and that's the whole point right let me see if we have any questions in the chat box looks like we're okay over there all right um, I, I have two chat boxes to check today so let me double check the Facebook chat box too okay looks like we're all right I think we're doing okay there all right good okay moving on um, one of the very powerful sh um, tools that we have at our beck and call so to speak is uh, the the simple line you know Paul Clay made a famous quote uh, that is is attributed with saying this and he says that um, a line is a dot that went for a walk <laughs> and I like that because uh, you know mark and line and dot all get kind of intermingled um, sometimes when we're talking about the tools of art but I want to show you two really wonderful painters when it comes to line this is Cy Twombly I love Cy Twombly. I love all these guys. As you know by now, there's, there aren't many artists that I don't love. I'm an art junkie. But Cy Twombly uh, was an amazing painter. Um, he was, I think he died in about 2011. He was an American painter. He was uh, born in Virginia in the United States, but he lived most of his time in Rome, in Italy. He spent a lot of his time over there. He was contemporaries with Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, but uh, he moved to Italy. I'm not quite sure when he moved to Italy, but he was there for the majority of his adult life. And um, his work has been kind of considered romantic if you will uh, he he refers a lot to poetry and um, he, he was an extremely well read and quite the um, intellectual so you know there are are snippets of poems and pieces of of quotes from books and things like that in his work and so I just think he's wonderful for the type of surface that he gives us to look at, first of all. And second of all, if you spend any time with his work, it's a, there's a huge payback because he gives you all of this kind of stuff on the surface to look at. You know, it's like, wow, it's got a lot of stuff going on. Um, and so you might say that his works are calligraphic and they're almost like graffiti um, they don't have much in the way of shape so, some of his blossom paintings have some shape to them but a lot of his painting is about this mark making on paper on on the canvas so um, taking a look at these lines and this kind of color you can see that he's setting up a kind of t um, a particular type of viewing space for us. He's giving us the opportunity to just spend time with the surface of this painting and investigate it. And it's not confrontational. It doesn't push you away. It pulls you in. So you really want to go in there and look at what he's doing and what he's saying and spend all kinds of time in there. Now, I get this all the time when I show Cy Twombly's work. Gee, it looks like a third, a three-year-old just took a piece of paper and a pencil and started scribbling around. Yeah, it sure does. And that's the beauty of it. Um, that quote from Picasso comes to mind every time I look at Cy Twombly, and that is that try to stay as a child when you're creating art that fresh childlike approach and you do get these amazing beautiful fresh paintings so that's my take on it um, I think it's highly evolved highly complex and the intention being to sort of lure us into this surface and to investigate it and spend time with it that for me 
is a huge payoff. I can spend a lot of time with a Cy Twombly piece. Every little mark makes me happy. And they're big too. They're, they're pretty big pieces. There's a couple of his pieces in the permanent collection here in San Francisco at the Museum of Modern Art. And if you're in the neighborhood or you're anywhere like New York or any other, other places where they have some of his work, definitely try to see it because it really is worth the effort to, to get that payoff. Um, the next person I want to show you when it comes to Mark is uh, someone else I'm, I'm kind of crazy about and this is Bryce Marden. This is from his Cold Mountain series. Uh, he He's still alive. He's, uh, you know, well, I'm going to say 70 maybe. And I um, want to just get you a little information. I lost my place. Where did it go? Darn it. Uh, lost my place about about Bryce Martin. Hold on one second. Okay, there we go. I got it. Um, these these pieces by uh, Bryce Martin were inspired by uh, Zen calligraphy, and uh, these are from the mid '80s. Um, the series title refers to uh, a a poet by the name of Han Shan who was known as Cold Mountain and was active in China during the Tang Dynasty. Um, so uh, Martin would dip a stick in a solution. Um, I'm not sure what that was. It was some type of sticky solution and then he would draw the poems and so he's basically drawing these Chinese characters and he would link both the characters and the couplets and then he would allow the material, I want to say it was ink but I don't think it was, um, he would allow that to drip and to form shapes and things like that. So he was very much inspired by Chinese calligraphy and Taoist philosophy when he was doing this. And if you look at the um, these lines and you compare them to Sai Twombly's lines, put that back up for a minute. So I'm, I'm going to make a stretch here and I'm going to kind of compare East and West. So Cy Twombly was in Italy and in Rome and I don't know if it's my imagination or if I or if this is a real thing but these seem western to me they you know Twombly's pieces seem western to me like in the west we read from left to right and in the east it's vertical it's more vertical so um, these pieces by Twombly seem to me to work in that Western way so that they that we can kind of look at them from a left to right perspective not so much vertically now if you look at Cold Mountain by Bryce Martin these definitely work to be read vertically from top to bottom so here is a very simple thing very simple element line that two artists are using in very very different ways and you know Bryce Marden's pieces are more sparse there's less going on there um, in terms of color and and mark making but of course there's a there's a lot of information if you pay attention but there's also this feeling of a sort of openness and a more meditative space it's quieter in a way there there's action going on in the in the Cold Mountain piece, but it's not the kind of action that you see in the Cy Twombly piece. This feels a lot more active. There's a lot more energy going on here. So do you see how the two intentions are different, Cy Twombly and um, Bryce Martin? They feel different, but they're both really primarily concerned with using line, okay? So um, just a little bit about intention today and setting up that space for your viewer and staying focused on what you're trying to create. 
shape, line, and color, primarily those three things, I'm going to just say hello to you all. Hi. <laughs> so thanks for joining me today on this little uh, slide lecture about composition and primarily about intention in uh, the type of, uh, you know, place or the type of energy you're setting up for the viewer, how you create that and how you use these major tools to do that. Now I want to go over to my iPad here and hopefully I can make this work. We'll just see here in a minute if in fact it works. I'm going to show you my iPad screen and oh it looks like it's working. Okay. So I want to draw a shape and I want you to see the difference between what I'm going to draw for you here. So I often ask people, I'm going to draw just draw a line down the middle of the page. I often ask people if you were in an ambulance going to the hospital and you could choose one or the other hospital to go into and these are the roof lines of the hospital. Here's hospital A and the roof line of the hospital looks like that. Here's hospital B and the roof line of the hospital looks like that. Architecturally this is just the roof line of the hospital. So every time I ask somebody that they choose this one. They want to go in that hospital. Now why is that? Because this hospital right here is soothing. That roof line is soothing and that's just a simple line. Just a simple line. So do you see how powerful a line can be? Let me um, do one more to show you what I mean. Alright, so if you think about um, shapes and you want to create something that is soothing which one of these two shapes are you going to choose? This shape or this shape? Right? Which shape is going to be most soothing? This one. Everybody chooses that one every time I do this. And the reason is very simple. The more softer geometric, or the softer organic shape is more soothing and the um, hard edge shape that looks like uh, a, some sort of throwing star, some kind of weapon, this one, that's not soothing at all. So you see how simple uh, shapes can be? Okay, one more thing. If you want to create soothing meditative space in a painting, what kind of line are you going to choose? Again, this goes back to the roof of the hospital, but here is this kind of line that I can create a very simple, I'm just going to create a really simple landscape there, you know, that's my, that's my landscape. Okay, soothing lines, right? Now, contrast that to this landscape. That looks like a little more rugged, doesn't it? You're going to have to put your hiking boots on to get into that landscape right? You know, and if we add in front of that, uh, how about if we add a spiky canvas, a uh, canvas, cactus, right? Spiky cactus, tough landscape, that's hiking boots. The, you know there's armadillos over there and all kinds of, you know, rattlesnakes and stuff, right? So do you get where I'm going with this? Line can be very, very powerful and shape can be very, very powerful. That's my little iPad demonstration for the day. Okay, so I want to just uh, wrap it up here.